Hi, my name is Carissa Fletcher. I'm a project manager with Brain Injury Canada, and I wanted to welcome you back today to our caregiver support webinar series. Today we have um, a guest today that is Barbie No. We were put in contact with her through Manitoba Brain Injury Association, and she is a caregiver of her daughter that suffered a traumatic brain injury many years ago. And I just wanted to welcome her here today and looking forward to hearing about her lived experience and some resources and tools that you know she's used from the beginning, the surviving days, as she calls it, um, all the way today, where you know it's it's some days it's just surviving, but really and truly she's found some tools that have worked well for her. Welcome, Barbie. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Carissa. Okay, so I had a few questions that I have prepared for you. Um, and hopefully we're able to just kind of go back and forth from there. Uh, so my first question is: um, in the early years of becoming a full-time caregiver. Um, how did you change your family roles in your home to, to better help you and to help the rest of your family? Um, okay, so in the beginning, I think that we were just kind of surviving and, and getting over the, the trauma of uh, being in the hospital for an extended period of time as um, our youngest daughter, who was 12, sustained a severe traumatic brain injury. Um, so when we did... Um, you know, move back into our home, uh, it was it was difficult because the roles were really blurred. Um, I became mama bear, um, very protective of, of our daughter because of, you know, seeing exactly what she went through. So um, everybody's roles kind of changed. The, the kids um, had to become very independent. Um, I think it's worth mentioning that Danica is our youngest and the other kids were, they're, they're all young adults. So um, that part of it was, you know, they were able to, to become independent and take on additional roles. I can't imagine if we had very young ones at home, how difficult that would have been. But, um, you know, everybody had to, had to help out and everybody had to really um, pick up and I think what my husband and I really did is I focused completely on our daughter I was the primary caregiver and he kind of put out all the fires with with the other kids so he was the go-to so that I could just focus on our daughter and be there for her 100 percent okay I like that there's like a conscious you know intention and effort that you know this is going to be my roles now like where before it probably was you know you just kind of picked up where you saw something needed to be done, right? You know, it was a kind of an equal partnership before then now it's it's still an equal partnership, but now it's a bit more specific, you know, I will do X, Y, and Z, and then you do A, B, and C, and we kind of <laughs> meet back and see if how mm -hmm. to go back to our roles, you know, at the end of the day. So yeah. being very intentional, I, I guess, about what it is that you both needed in order to keep things, keep things running as best you could. Mm -hmm. And education was really important. Like we had to sit down with them on a regular basis and let them know that, you know, these are, I mean, although we were early into it and still learning ourselves um, from what we were told to prepare for, you know, we had to share that with, with, the, with her sibling, kind of clear boundaries while she was still recovering in the early days. Right. Yeah. Um, I've, I've read about your story before. Or in, in, a, in a few articles, and I've heard you speak on the importance of communication. And we all know it's key to ensuring, you know, that everything runs as smoothly as it can. But can you give in real terms, like some examples of, you know, how you made um, changes in, in your communication style or, you know, what you communicated with your family in order to help you as, as you know, as the caregiver um, not have such a big of a challenge? You know, so communication is the key and having regular family meetings, sometimes with our daughter and sometimes without so that, you know, they could share their frustrations or um, feel safe to say things without hurting anybody's feelings or for fear of, you know, let's say, an out, uh, you know, having her have a, a breakdown or an outburst. So just providing a safe environment for everybody to, to talk about their feelings and you know, even, even the impact on them that they're missing their parents, because really, um, 100% of our time was devoted to her, especially in the early stages. And I mean, now they're, 
they're all young adults and starting their own families. So um, they had to grow up very quickly and um, because of brain injury. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned that, you know, your, your house was kind of like that safe haven, that social place of gathering and stuff um, beforehand. And so I imagine, you know, for you as well, you know, you must have had like, you know, a very fun social life and outgoing. So how do you manage, you know, for yourself, um, you know, now that there's been like this huge change and, you know, in the early years, I understand, you know, you were completely, you know, shut in and very isolated, but now that, you know, things have changed a little bit and you've learned a bit more, um, how have you managed in your social life? I think that that's one piece that really is non-existent in our mm. in our life uh, again as a ripple effect of of the brain injury and you know just working with other um, support groups for brain injury that's a very common theme that you see and so I think it's I, I, I my friends are still my friends I love them I always will they 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 always have a place in my heart but when you're dealing with something like this you really need to have uh, um, opportunities to re-energize and if you're constantly explaining your situation over and over and just not really feeling that you're being understood or that they just don't get it and they miss kind of you and your family participating in the old activities that you used mm -hmm. to do with them that over time they just kind of give up asking and so consequently we kind of look for um new um areas to re-energize or new and that for us has meant um connecting with other people who are living the same reality so both my husband and I have um you know reached out to our local brain injury association and um you know, my husband has been uh really pushing for more supports and services for young survivors because we noticed that that was a huge gap um, and it was really difficult for us to find supports for her because she's living the same reality. She's lost, she's had to deal with so many um, losses in her life, you know, not only as a result of the brain injury, but the so socialization piece the physical activities that she used to love to do that she can't do anymore because of the of the injury. And um, I think the hardest piece for, for her, as well as for us, is you see everybody kind of moving on with their with their life and with their dreams. And we're having to constantly adapt and readjust and make different kind of goals and dreams based on our new reality, living a, a new reality, which where we've had to deal with a lot of losses, including so, social isolation. And so both our daughter and ourselves find um, the greatest support connecting with people who are living the same reality. Right. So it's, it, yeah, I think, I guess that's the, the biggest takeaway is, you know, finding people that have a similar lived experience Mm -hmm. um, whether that be within brain injury or being a caregiver, probably in exactly. general, mm -hmm. um, is, is that connection piece where it's like, okay, I understand where you're coming from and I understand mm -hmm. the responsibilities that are beyond just, you know, the regular day to day and living, um, mm -hmm. and that it goes much deeper than that. And then you can kind of form your friendship around that because there's no need to, there's no need to explain again. Um, yes. it's a one time I'm a caregiver. Oh, I get it. Mm -hmm. All right. Now let's begin. Right, mm -hmm. and you can kind of take that your friendships from there, or those new relationships um, that you form through the association. You know, kind of from that point of view. One thing I've noticed in you know in, in us talking is that you you focus on you focus on your daughter, right? And you know, as being the full time caregiver, that is second nature. That's first nature, probably. That your first thing you do as well. I have to about her, and I have to make sure that her needs are being met. But something that I wanted to try and I turn it around a little bit, if that's okay, is to ask you about, you know, what are those things that are helping you and, you know, what re-energizes you or um, what are some of the things that, you know, help you get through your days when things are getting tough or what are those like things that you celebrate 
and you're like, yeah, I did this, you know, despite it all, I'm, I'm here and I'm still doing this. So mm -hmm. um, I have another question for you, if that's okay. okay. Um, and this one's, this one's probably going to be a little bit of a tricky one, but I've read that, you, you know, you've talked about, you know, developing a thick skin. And um, what are those things that, you know, you keep in mind to protect yourself when, you know, I don't know if it's, you know, outside world is kind of getting in and, you know, bugging you, or it, you're just, it's been a tough week, it's been a tough day. And, you know, what are those things that you use to kind of like arm yourself and, and, and keep going? How do you, how do you do that? How do you develop? I, I need to know that for myself. I'm not even a full-time caregiver, but I need to, <laughs> those, those tricks, those, those little tips that you've, you've developed over those years. Okay. Well, those, that, those are really good questions. So you're right. Typical caregiver will kind of always put themselves last. And that's, you know, because your focus for so long has been on, on the survivor. So since this is all about caregivers, although this is hard to talk about because, you know, I never want her to feel that, um, that she's a burden or any no, in any way no, because no, no. because that's not that's not the case. Um, but we do as caregivers put ourselves last and make sure that everybody, you know, that everybody in the family is doing okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, despite the circumstances. So what I have found or my husband and I have, have found helpful is that we work as a team, number number one. We we have to. And um, that means we don't have as much time for ourselves as a couple, um, which is, is difficult to find that couple, couple time, um, but we have to, that's what's working for us right now is kind of tagging off, you know, when I'm done and, and knowing that I need a break and, you know, some of the signs and symptoms of that are when I, you know, become a little bit more impatient or irritable, and it's like, okay, I need, I need a break and I need to take off with my husband or, you know, another family member that, that also, you know, cares for our daughter. Um, some of the things that I think um, work for me, um, you know, what my husband and I term this is like, deliberate intentional life-giving activities that's what we call like it like that deliberate intentional life-giving life -giving, activities yes, where okay. we actually like this is deliberate we need to do this and for um you know so we seek out activities deliberately to ensure that we have that we know that it's going to be positive for us so i said i've had to leave those you know even though I don't, uh, they're still my wonderful friends, but I've had to seek out positive experiences for me. So whether it's, you know, going out for a walk and just being uh, alone and with nature and having an opportunity to decompress and just, you know, take some deep breaths and, you know, be alone and think about things or exercising. Um, that's, you know, something. So I make sure that one hour out of the day, I have an opportunity for myself to do something that's positive, deliberately knowing what's negative and staying away from that. That's energy sucking in your life or energy that, that takes away energy and knowing that you need activities that are positive and that are going to re-energize you. Something where you're getting positive feedback and, and validation and, um, yeah, so it, it's taking time for you, self-care. So I have one final question for you, and that is, I guess it's in two parts, so maybe it's a, a bit long-winded of me, but if you could talk to other caregivers, what would you tell them to help get them through, you know, a challenging day or week? And I guess the second part of it is, are there any, you know, tips or things that you, you wish you had known, you know, years before in, in, your, in your journey that... You think, oh man, I wish I had known that, or wish someone had said that to me, and then I could have, you know, put that into practice sooner, or um, yeah, anything like that. Does anything kind of come to mind? Mm -hmm. um, the best piece of advice that I was given, and I realize that it is absolutely true, is that it is a marathon; it's not a sprint, and mm -hmm. there's no quick fix with this. You're in for the long haul, and so you need strategies to be able to. Um, 
to be able to handle this? And as a caregiver, um, what are some of those strategies? I have learned, I think the hard way that um, self-care, because that is the first thing that really goes, mm-hmm. um, that, you know, you just, you put your needs last because your focus is, is the survivor and your family. Um, so it is really important to take those moments and look after yourself because if you're not looking after yourself, how can you be the best caregiver possible for your for your loved one? Um, the second one is not to be afraid to say no. That was really, really difficult mm. for me in the beginning as I was saying yes to, to everything and um, kind of thinking that you could function as a superwoman and after a while it catches up with you. I mean, you can't be running a marathon every day um, because it catches up with you after a while. And I learned that the hard way in the sense that um, your own health starts to suffer after a while. You know, you mm-hmm. become emotionally and physically drained. You're not sleeping well. Um, so you really need to, you know, look after yourself and don't be afraid to say no to you know, to, to things we've had to say no all the time now. I mean, if we know that we're being invited to an event that is not going to be positive for our daughter or ourselves, we say no and um, no worries now. There's no worries. Yeah. We, we have um, developed uh, a script that we share with people that you know this is kind of where things are at and it's now it's just part of our it's it's second nature now and so I think it's important that um you're able to set boundaries for early on because that will help you in the long run for sure but educating your your family and people who are in your bubble letting them know really like um about the brain injury, how it's affected your life. And if you do have to say no, or if you can only attend functions for, you know, if it's half an hour or why not, there's a reason for it. And for them not to take it personally, is that we're always making decisions that are in the best interest of um, our family with our daughter's um, health uh, at the forefront. Because if, if, we don't set her up for success. Ultimately, we're not setting ourselves up for success. So we've learned through the evolution of her brain injury what works and what doesn't work. And we've put strategies in place. So, you know, um, we've had to change our traditions, uh, Christmases, holidays, everything to accommodate the the injury. You know, now when family comes over, it's for scheduled visits, timed visits. Um, because we know if, if we go over that time, it's not going to be, um, it's not going to be positive for anybody, especially, especially our daughter who, you know, we're looking at, but it's not going to be fun for anybody if, so we have checks and balances in place and we're not afraid to, we're really not afraid to say no to activities now that, um, that just aren't going to be a positive experience for anybody. And then consequently, like kind of suck everybody out. Like energy conservation is huge because we're in this for, again, it's a marathon. So um, it's making decisions that you know are going to um, be healthy for you in the long run. So. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for for sharing um, your experience and so candidly, you know, being so honest and, um, upfront about, you know, it is a challenge and, but it's a challenge that you wouldn't give away. You know, that's your, that is, you know, your, she's your person and that um, you 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 are her full-time caregiver and you're, you're proud of that, you know, and you said how far you've come and, and the gratitude that you have for um, how far all of you have come as a family, mm-hmm. I think speaks volumes. So um, I want to say thank you to you for sharing and those tips that I, you know, I will even be using in my own day-to-day practice and just learning that, you know, saying no is okay because you're saying yes to yourself, right? Mm-hmm. You're saying yes to yourself and to the positive experiences that you want to be having. And yeah. um, I think having that in mind is so key. So thank you so much, Barbie, for, for, for being here today and for, for sharing your experience.
Thank you so much. I um, I am really um, really pleased to see um, different associations in the brain injury of Canada focusing on caregivers um, because it is an area that I think it 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 does. We do need to um, share a spotlight on it because I, I know for a fact, and my daughter has told us that we have made a difference in her recovery. And so caregivers um, need access to supports and services and hearing other caregivers and what's worked and what hasn't worked. And certainly I'm no uh, pro in this area. I can just share with you know what has worked in our situation. And I hope that this can be helpful for other people who are living the same reality as a caregiver. And I'm very appreciative of this opportunity. So thank you. Thank you.